Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to introduce all of you to Michelle Benio, an early childhood parenting coach and mentor who is also a certified grief recovery specialist. Michelle will be speaking to us today from Bloomington, Minnesota. When Michelle's daughter was only three and a half years old, her beloved six-year-old big brother, who was her best friend and only sibling, died of cancer. She said to Michelle, Mommy, half of me is gone. The loss was devastating, and it left an unfillable void in her young being, and there was little available to help Michelle, who was teaching early childhood parenting classes at the time, to navigate her family's unthinkable new reality. Today, Michelle's precious daughter is all grown up and Michelle is busy helping families to heal and live forward with grief after the death of their child. Her good grief parenting approach helps parents get in touch with their parenting wisdom so that they can be confident that they are helping their bereaved young child to grieve well as they become hopeful about a future for their family that is bright with possibilities and even joy. I'm eager to talk with Michelle about early childhood aged children's grief, particularly after sibling loss, her own daughter as a case study for her work, her good grief parenting approach and more for what will surely be an insightful and very touching interview. Hi, Michelle. A Hi, Irene. Welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. It's such a pleasure, really, truly. Mm. Why don't we begin with, begin with this question? How about sharing your heart-wrenching story of losing your six-year-old son after his battle with cancer? Okay. Yes, that's where it all begins. And Um, You know, David was my firstborn son, I had him in my mid 30s. So I was an older parent, um, you know, just so ready to become a mom, and had this beautiful boy. And um, it was interesting, because uh, after he was born, I just really felt this sense of foreboding, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I knew it wasn't baby blues. That was not what I was experiencing. But it was it really was this feeling of foreboding that I was not going to see this child grow up. And I didn't really understand that and was able, uh, you know, after some time to just focus on how beautiful and exuberant and uh, precious he was and for, uh, you know, to raise him as as my son. And then when he was about three and a half, um, uh, well, and, and along with this uh, becoming a mom and loving it so much. That's when I decided to go back and get my master's degree and become an early childhood parent educator because I was at my first degree was in education. And I became um, an educator here in Minnesota, we have that program in every school district, working with parents of young children. So I thought I would love to do that while I'm raising my own young children. What an inspiration he was for you. Yes, he he really was. I mean, having him just really kind of um, shape the direction of my life even before the outcome of his sh- too short life, which was to lose him. Um, so when my daughter was about a year old, I I had then graduated from college uh, or with my master's uh, and got my first job. And just a few months into that first job as an early childhood parent educator, she was 15 months old. Her brother was three and a half when he was diagnosed with cancer. And so um, one of the things I had encountered in my um, university years was, or courses, was a, a teacher who talked about family's loss of dreams. And that really touched my heart. It really impressed on me that as a parent educator, I wanted to sort 
uh, support families through their loss of dreams. And little did I know that just a few months later, that was going to be me. And so I, I continued to do this work while we were experiencing this grief as a family, because it was grief when my children's normal, ordinary, carefree childhood was taken away from them with my son's illness. May I ask and you what kind of cancer he had? Michelle? He had a rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a soft tissue cancer. Wow. Um, he had it in his perineal area. And um, yeah, and so he was went through his treatment for two and a half years. For a little guy, he must have been in pain with the chemotherapy and everything. Else. Well, one of the amazing things, and you know, when I was in the hospital with um, him and was, you know, we were at a children's hospital. And of course, we had a, a pediatric oncologist who had seen many, many children this way. And it's amazing how much stamina those little cancer children have, we would come home and he would hop out of the car and go run and play before wow. he even went into the house. In the end, he had a lot of pain. But in the beginning, um, you know, it was, he was one of those kids who when I uh, oh, there's there's so much. I don't want to get too much down this rabbit hole. There's so much in this um, because he was really a tender hearted child. And when he was diagnosed, I thought, oh, no, I don't I don't know if this child can survive this because uh, um, needle pokes were really hard for him, uh, many of those things. But the way that he went through the treatment was just awe inspiring to me. And um, the thing that was also interesting about the journey was the response of his sister, which of course is, you know, it's her story that has been what I have um based my work going forward on. And she was, as I said, only 15 months old. And the first night that David was in the hospital. Uh, his dad was with him. I was home with her and she, and I was not a basket case. I, you know, we had been through this trauma. She knew something big was going on in our family, but you know, I was in control. Um, but that night she wandered around the house, just wailing the sound she was making was inhuman. It was just alarming to me. And I went to her and tried to comfort her and she'd push me away and throw herself on the floor. And she was only 15 months old. And she knew that something really awful had happened to her family. And so we decided as a, as a result of that, and just seeing how, how this separation was so hard on her, we decided right then and there that when three of us were in the hospital, she was going to be there with us. So unlike a lot of families who want to protect their wealth or their healthy children from, um, you know, the environment of a hospital full of sick kids with bald heads and patches on their chests and tubes coming out of them, we just said, she's not going to be in the neighborhood with loving neighbors, not knowing what's happening to her family. And that was a good decision because she got to spend those two and a half years while he spent much of it in the hospital with him in a children's hospital. And this, I should say to you and your listeners, this was 20 years ago. I think you mentioned that this little 15 month old is now grown. Um, and so at that time, before, you know, circumstances in hospitals are very different now. But at that time, she could be there and spend a lot of time with him. And it so she did that. Too, also. It must have oh, been absolutely. To see her there was almost like bringing a little normalcy. Yes. Into his life. Because they were very close. It was interesting before I even knew I was pregnant with her. Um, he said to me one day out of the blue that he wanted a little sister. And he didn't know that I was just then thinking I might be pregnant. And I took a pregnancy test and I was. And as it turns out, he had a little sister. And I always thought, 
you know, there is, there is, I always say children have a connection. They, know. they have they, a connection. They, they, they have a connection. They a actually- silver thread. Yes. Yes. And the two of them were, um, they were just so close to each other. They were each other's biggest fan and were very close. And so, yes, I, I am just so grateful they were able to develop that. And as you shared, then, you know, he went through this illness and an, another thing that, so he, he did his first protocol, which was a year and his cancer retreated very quickly. It was, um, you know, it, it, the can the tumor was gone, but they said, you know, we need to do surgery to make sure it's gone. And they did surgery, but then his cancer came back again, very quickly. In the same which, spot? In the same yes. Spot. Oh. Yeah. And, and this time it was in his bone marrow. And this is the nature of this cancer. It is really, and it is a, a devast, it is a bad one. And it, if it comes back, the uh, chances of survival, you know, are, are next to nothing. So when it came back, we knew that he was in for a hard road. And he, um, he had one of the first stem cell transplants that they did at that children's hospital. He had high dose radiation that was just, just awful on, you know, worse than, or high dose chemo, which was worse than the regular chemo. And then he also did have radiation. And how heartbreaking and how hard Yes, your husband. Yes. My God. And he started, you know, he started really feeling, um, Uh, down on himself uh, about this. I mean, he started being very unhappy and we ended up, I ended up getting a a child psychologist to work with him because he was threatening to cut his stomach open. I mean, it was, it was hard. Um, But one thing that happened in the midst of this, which was also a gift and ties in with that premonition that I had um, was after his, um, cancer came back the second time we took him in and the doctors didn't really think that was what it was because they thought it was too soon for it to be back, but it was back, but he didn't know this because he had been so groggy from being put under for the MRI. And so we didn't tell him that night that his cancer was back and he had always slept very fitfully um, as as a little kid, he had had night terrors and things. And that night, um, we could hear him in his room talking to someone we had the, the, the monitor on, and we could hear him and he was saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then he listened for a while. And he said, All right, I'll come. And so we heard this. Wow, wow. I will. Yeah, I I woke my husband up to hear this with me. And I thought, how can I make this mean something else? You know, how can this, this can't mean what I think it means. Um, But the next morning we we talked to him and he didn't remember talking to anybody. uh, But he was a totally different kid in that he was, his spirit was lifted, he was helpful, he was Um, I just really do believe that he was visited by an angel or a heavenly being that made him, that let him know what was going to happen to him and let him know that he was going to be okay. And that we, yes, yes. And so even though I didn't like what I thought we had heard, we, we kind of, you know, went forward with that in the back of our minds. And of course, eventually then David did die and, um, and his little sister, you know, he died, David died at home because after they had done all of those things, um, his cancer did, you know, they got the cancer, but it again, immediately came back a third time. And they said, you know, there's really nothing more we can do. And so we just kept him home with us and he died, um, 
the night that he he died, he had been unresponsive for a couple of days and I was holding him and rocking him and singing to him. And I said to his dad, you've got to, you know, get our bed so that he can come in our bed with us tonight. And so he kind of, you know, got the pillows and things arranged and we took David into our bed between us and he died that night. Wow. But when when I was holding him and rocking him and told his dad, you know, to get the bed ready, he smiled at me. David smiled at me and he had not been responsive. Um, so it's, it's, to me, it, it sounds like not only that, but being spiritual the way I am now with all of my experiences, it feels like this was a, almost like a setup of an agreement you might have had with David because this experience led to you to what's your sole purpose and what you're doing now. Yes, yes. And it did really very quickly um, because, because I, you know, I mean, and, and this is the gift that I think I was given to give to parents because I was in this field where I really was attuned to my son when he got sick and to my daughter when she said what she said and that um, their well-being, I had to do whatever I could for their well-being, like finding someone to work with my son when he was so distraught. And then um, when my daughter said, mommy, half of me is gone. And I thought, okay, she's got her whole life ahead of her. And this is not okay. She can't grow up with half of her gone. I'm going to have to take care of this, but I'm in this field. I can find the resources, but I could not find anything that helped me know how to raise her through a life of being um, a sibling who had had half of herself stripped away. And being in early childhood development, I knew when she said, mommy, half of me is gone, that that was a true statement, that her identity was as her brother's sister. And to no longer have that, him living beside her was, you know, at the age where she was just figuring out who oh she my was. God. was. In her most formative years. Yes. So now she's growing up. Do you get her therapy? What did you do? And how did her mindset um, change or develop as she matured? And then she became a case study for your work. So tell us about yeah, that. Yeah. Well, I'd say she was a case study because from the very beginning, I don't, you know, to respond the way she did the first night he was in the hospital just really alerted me in the very beginning before we'd even figured out how we were going to go forward that I needed to always be looking at her as well as looking at him, that she was going through this too, and that I really had to do what was best for her as well. And I'm so thankful to have been given that insight. And then when she said, half of me is gone, um, how many three and a half year olds would articulate their loss that way. I don't know of very many. Again, that was a gift to me to say, okay, she's just told you, you don't have to guess. And one of the things, Irene, is that when, even though she said that to me, if you looked at this little girl, you didn't see the sadness on her the way that we so typically see the sadness of a loss on an adult because children don't do grief the way we do. So she would be playing and she'd be running and she'd be being Deanna, who was just this, you know, um, little sprite, you know. Um, and I, I could have missed her grief if I hadn't, if she hadn't shown it to me that way. And so, you know, over the years, uh, I, and you asked it, I, I did before, even before David died, I also found for her a child psychologist because I knew that she was going to need someone, you know, after her brother died. And so she had this psychologist that she would go see and do play therapy with. And, um, 
And then she got to a point where that was less and less. But in some of those early years in her elementary years, and I'm not I'm not sure when she last saw Susan, her psychologist, but there were times in her years as she grew where she'd say, I need to go see Susan. And then I'd take her to see this woman and, you know, she would check in on how she was processing her grief at that time. And so we had that relationship in the beginning and then just, you know, took advantage of it when Deanna felt like she needed it. And, um, you know, became her troubleshooter. Yeah, yeah, she did. And so that was just really a good, um, a good understanding again, you know, that I, that I was able to identify from the beginning that she needed this. And I think now maybe these 20, 22 years, actually, my son died in 2000. These 22 years later, I think parents are more aware of some of these supports and how important they are for kids. But still, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I think a lot of parents really do not understand that a three-year-old is, you know, really does need the support and they need more than they typically would get even from a caring parent. I think what you're doing is wonderful because I I also observe children and parents and sometimes kids are displaying um, problems that are going on or issues that they have. And I, and sometimes because I'm more, um, educate about how therapy helps and all, and all the different ways mm-hmm. that, um, uh, that it can make a difference. I'll sometimes see a situation and I'll think to myself, wow, I wish those people were more enlightened because yes. the counselor would be so helpful to that situation, to that situation. And it's not about being afraid to share your problems with someone mm-hmm. it's about being courageous enough mm-hmm. to have your problems hit the air and, and, and clear them. Mm-hmm. And, and the, And the fact that we don't, you know, before I lost my son, I didn't know anything about grief. I'd had, you know, a couple of grandmothers die who lived far away that I didn't see very often. And I'd never had anyone close to me die. And I really didn't know how to live with grief right present in my life. And we, most of us don't. And the things that I had learned growing up, Um, you know, were not helpful things, the things that most of us learn, which is not to talk about grief. When I went to visit my mother in Georgia, after my son had died, she did not say a word to me about it, not a word. In fact, after dinner, she went to bed as quickly as she could and left me sitting out there alone. And I thought, I don't believe my mother is not talking to me about my son dying. Um, So, but she no. She refused to counsel her herself. Yes, but she, she was just bottling up all her feelings. Herself. Oh, of course, she was not. You know, she wasn't <laughs> callous. She just didn't. You know, she didn't know how to deal with it. Her mother had, you know, really not dealt with those things very openly or or well. That gets passed on. That's what we learn. And so I. That's again why I do what I do is to help parents who are struggling with what they're feeling versus what the messages they've got about how okay or not okay it is for what they're feeling. So that's a big part of it. And you asked, you know, to go back to Deanna a bit, um, you know, you asked about how she did over the years. Yeah, and the thi- how is the, she now that she's... Yes. Here. Well, the other thing, um, she... The other thing that she um, showed me and that I knew, uh, but really got to to learn with her is that every time a child um, develops, you know, go gets more cognitive development and more understanding of death and loss and relationships, then it's gonna it's gonna come up in their lives again. When we think, if for adults we we think that we cope with our grief and we know how to cope with our grief. And then, you know, we carry on our lives and we kind of understand how grief has a role in our lives, but with children, it continues to change as they grow. And so, you know, with her, I just could see for 
example, adolescence was a hard time for her. It's hard for all kids. But she had on top of that the fact that she knew she should have had an older brother who was kind of, you know, her advocate. Yeah, and he was a cool older brother. Yes. Yeah. And he wasn't there. And her friends had siblings and she didn't. And she really wanted someone to be hers. And sometimes the way that she tried to make friends and keep friends um, was a little too assertive, um, you know, was not appreciated. So she didn't she didn't always have good friend experiences because she was trying to replace this um, sibling that she'd lost. And a lot of friends and friends' parents didn't understand her behavior or the basis for it. And so I really had to advocate for her in different ways. And in some cases, I I couldn't, I just needed to support her, you know, within the walls of our own home. But I think it's important for adults to know that when a child has had a loss, even in those really early years, it's going to impact how they, um, how they do social relationships through the rest of their lives. And I saw that with her through her, her years. During that period, did that counselor Susan help her at all with, with um, what she was going through um, socializing with kids? Well, you know, Susan didn't really deal with her on that. I get, you know, we never did. There were also times in Deanna's life. I mean, I think at some point where she didn't want to go to Susan anymore. And I, think in those adolescent years, um, you know, part of her thinking was to, and part of mine, frankly, was, um, you know, not wanting to uh, stigmatize this or, you know, one of the things I grappled with, which I think is another thing uh, parents need to hear, is what part of what my child is experiencing is grief and loss and what part is normal development. And I don't want to call attention to something as, you know, an adolescent, you don't want, I didn't want to make her feel like something was wrong or, and I didn't want to label her, you know, as, as something being the cause of the way that she Develop the way she behaved. There's always that balance when you have grief in your life with a child. There's always that balance of what do I need to um, care about and what do I need to help my child um, recognize is kind of growing pains, you know? And so that was part of, I think, what. I how I went through her adolescence with her and part of what she had to discover was how to do social relationships based on who she is because of her experiences. And who is she today? Is she is she doing anything uh, as she's becoming an adult that is going to bring her into the arena with helping children or wherever or she's going into the opposite She is. She really isn't. One thing that she she is amazingly intuitive, perceptive, um, empathetic with other people who are having challenges because of something they've experienced. She's very aware and very intuitive. She I say that she is the best friend that a person could have because she is really uh, thoughtful about people's feelings in a really positive way. Um, And she's very smart about what to do with those feelings because she she learned so much of this uh, from her own experiences. And um, but she is not interested, for example, in, you know, working with me. I mean, if I ask her following your footsteps, no, no. And not, you know, she, um, yeah, she's not interested in helping someone as a profession. I think she's kind of done so much. Yes. She's done so much kind of, um, understanding and recognizing her own dynamics and her own inner workings that she, 
you know, and I know for me, one reason why I started my work as late as I did, because I knew when I couldn't find resources way back in 2000, that when I did figure, I knew I had to figure out how to raise my daughter to be whole and happy. And when I figured out what that entailed, I was going to have to share that because that wasn't out there. But I didn't start doing it really until my daughter was out of high school in 2015. And even after that, because I could not step into, I couldn't put myself in a place to step into other people's journeys until mine, until I was through mine. And I didn't know that in the beginning. I kind of learned that along the way. So isn't that interesting? How yeah, it seemed to have, we don't see it at the time, but there seems to be a certain kind of timing. Yes. That happens in our lives. So let me, let me say you are an early childhood coach and mentor, and you're also a certified grief recovery specialist. Could you yes. those terms for us? And why do you call yourself a discovery partner instead of a therapist or grief counselor? Oh, all good questions, Irene. Thank you for asking that because because this is the area of confusion for a lot of people. A lot of people, um, you know, that I talk to about what I do, they immediately think I'm a counselor or a therapist. I'm not. I don't have that training. I don't have that licensure. Um, an early childhood parent educator is a is an education license for the early childhood uh, age which is birth to eight, typically. So you could or, be teaching school. Uh, yeah, I, I could be teaching um, early childhood classes, which is what parenting classes, which is what I did. Here in Minnesota, we have early childhood family education, ECFE, in every school district. And those programs are made up of parent educators and children's teachers. And so I was the parent educator part. And I had the parents while their kids were in with a children's teacher. And I taught all of that. Um, and that's what I went back. I had had a teaching license, but it wasn't for that age group. And I went back and got that. Um, and that was what really, you know, immersed me in all of these um, awarenesses about what's best for children. And that was really what I wanted to do because I had parents who were less than sensitive about young children. I'll just put it that way. And so that was part of my motivation too, was the role modeling I'd had and I wanted to do it differently. So that's where I was when I had my children. And then after my son died and my daughter said what she said, I knew that I had a lot of um, a foundation that I needed. And I knew that I could go out and do this, you know, work with families, but I wanted a credential. And so I looked at, you know, what was out there for grief training or, or uh, for someone like me. And I found the Grief Recovery Institute, which has um, several books that they've published, the Grief Recovery Handbook, and they had a book called When Children Grieve. And so I got certified through them to deliver their uh, grief recovery method and their um, program for adults based on the book When Children Grieve. I'm certified to, pre to do both of those, but what I do is just takes information from what I learned from them. I learned a lot about healthy grief and the reasons why people don't grieve well and, and the misinformation about grief. Um, the things that are helpful for children that are, to me, the most important parts of what I do that's different than what anyone else does are things that come out of my early childhood parent educator background and my understanding of child development. And so I am that, and I am a, a coach. I have also got... Um, coaching certification through two different programs. Um, and so I call myself a, a coach, but I really like the word mentor better because I really just want, I want to share what I know about good parenting for any child, not just grieving children. And, um, 
and what I know from my experience. I would imagine that if a person's having some behavioral problems with their child, you'd be a great person to go to, not necessarily for even grief, but like this is going on. What is, how's the best way for maybe Mm -hmm. a child's being bullied or whatever, even something like that, you could probably help a lot. Yeah, that that is not my focus. I really do focus on the grief area. And it's hard. It's hard to stay focused there. Because yes, the things that I give to families are good information for all families. I I do a lot with um, emotion coaching, you know, which is an approach to helping children manage their emotions that is not based in in uh, punishment and, you know, discipline, limit setting, yes, but kind of another approach to helping kids learn about emotions. And it is just such a a more um, part, it builds a bond between parent and child, a stronger bond between parent and child to do that kind of parenting. And so that really is why I'm a coach and a mentor. And I am the person that I wanted when my son died because I was grieving and I didn't hadn't experienced grief before. I went to some grief support groups and got good information about um, grief. I did not need a therapist. I didn't need a counselor. I wasn't. I wasn't in this place where I could not function. I wanted someone to help me parent my child. What's good parenting? What are what are the ways that I can, um, you know, raise my family, manage our household in ways that are going to help my daughter have the best foundation for her life experience and her loss, as well as me. Parenting, Parenting while grieving is doing the two hardest things in our lives at the same time. Absolutely. So someone comes to you and there, there's been an, a, an unfortunate loss and they call you their dis- why do you, so at, so you say you're their discovery partner and then mm-hmm. you use tools to equip them to discover yes. their own wisdom tell us a little bit about yeah that. well i have what i call the good grief parenting approach and it's the pieces that i discovered along the way that um that contribute to uh, healthy parenting and healthy responses to grief. And I started out, you know, I say I'm a parenting support, parenting mentor, and I focus on parenting, and I focus on the bereaved sibling. But the truth is, when the family comes to me, when the parents come to me, they have their own grief, and I can't work with them on their children's grief without supporting their own grief. And so one of the things that I start with in the in the good grief parenting approach, I have four heartbeats. And the first one is good grief beliefs. So I start with parents helping them understand that you know, growing up learning that you don't talk about grief is not helpful, that talking about grief is what's helpful. And I help them understand that this is helpful with kids too, that we don't need to protect them. We need to, you know, I mean, my daughter knew what was going on. I couldn't just say to her, oh, you're going to be okay and expect her to be okay. She wasn't going to be okay. Neither was I but we were capable and we were going to get through it. And I understood, you know, I, I understood how to have conversations with her. And so I help parents with these kinds of understandings and give them ideas and approaches uh, to counteract maybe what they learned in their own growing up. The second heartbeat is enduring bonds and it helps parents to um, be aware of their bond with their living child, their bond with their deceased child, because that bond doesn't end. Even though um, a lot of people tell us we need to move on. And are, do you think you're, you know, think, you know, you kept your child's bedroom the same? Don't you think you're sort of, you know, obsessing? No, all of that is perfectly healthy. That's the idea of continuing the bond with your deceased child. And that's really important for um, for a bereaved sibling. My daughter continued her relationship with her brother 
We talked about him at home. She talked about him at home. We remembered him. We carried him forward. Now, how um, long did you keep his room set up? Well, way? she shared the room with him. And so, oh, wow. um, you know, and, and one of the things that Deanna um, took away from that experience was a real aversion to change. And so, you know, she did not. I remember one time I bought a new uh, table for the living room and she I she was at it, we another part of my daughter's loss is that my husband and I ended up getting divorced um, soon after our son died. It was not because of our son's loss, which some people like to, you know, kind of go to that conclusion. But she came home and I bought a new table and she was upset because I didn't warn her. Because she was she so much disruption in her life. Yeah, she, she does. She just, this. and to this day, she doesn't like change. And so the, you know, the bedroom really hasn't changed that much. Um, but we have things, you know, like I have here a pair of his shoes in my closet. You know, I have his Pokemon hat um, sitting by my desk. I have his Pokemon sweatshirt on the back of my chair in my sanctuary where I go read books and do devotions, you know, his, his, so those are some of the ways that we, um, and, and we eat French silk pie on his birthday every year, because when he was in the last days, when he was dying, one of the few things that he wanted to eat was French silk pie. And we let him eat all the French silk pie he wanted, because we really didn't have to worry about his health, you know, at that point. I mean, sure. so let me ask you also, you have a wonderful story about lemonade. Oh, well, that's the lemonade stand. Yes. Um, and that's the approach to well, and to finish my just quickly my um, sure. good grief parenting approach. So the third, um, the third heartbeat is essential messages. And the fourth heartbeat is choice actions, which is kind of choosing to do things in your family that are going to be healing and helpful. Well, give us an example of that, for instance. Well, um, well, for instance, um, essential messages is uh, that idea that your child needs to be know and they need to get messages through your interactions and your words that they're valued, that they're cared for, that they're capable, you know, that we will get through this. All of those things, those are messages every child needs. But I have them as one of the uh, heartbeats for the good grief parenting approach. Choice actions would be doing things that demonstrate that, um, like, you know, like my daughter and I have uh, an understanding that we, um, you know, we don't go to bed angry. I mean, we always say, I love you when we part. Um, and that, and those are, you know, those things become non negotiable. It's a choice action that we're going to reinforce that essential message every day. That's just a simple example. Um, another example might be, you know, we're going to, when families get in tune with um, how important it is to talk about things, that we are going to talk about, you know, our, our grief, um, or they might decide to have a, a a signal or something that they do when they don't want to talk now, but they'll talk late. I mean, just things that you put into place that ensure that you're going to do grief in your family in the healthiest way possible that works for your family, because that's individual. You know, there isn't one way to do any of this. And you help people really to choose what yes. is effective for them. Like for like just a, a real, real small example in my life, uh, my grandsons are nine and they're getting very cool and they don't always want to acknowledge their grandmother. Mm -hmm. So I have a code with them. I say, if you can't, if you don't want to really let me know you <coughs> love me in front of all your friends, tap on your heart and I'll tap on mm -hmm. my heart. And sometimes I've seen them win at a baseball game, be surrounded by their friends and look at me and just like tap their hearts. Oh, and that's perfect. I love that. In fact, I will share that as an example. Yes, just and you know, isn't that just a strong 
bond building little gesture that you'll have with them for the rest of their lives. And it's such a simple thing. So that's just a really a wonderful example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So tell us about the lemonade. The lemonade. So the lemonade is, um, it reinforces the essential message. I mean, it's related to essential messages in that it is something that I did with my daughter. The hardest thing about me losing my son, the absolute hardest thing was that my daughter lost her brother and she had to grow up without him. And I still to this day have my temper tantrum moments when I look at something in her life, either past, present, or future, and say, I want David here with her for that. I want her to have her brother. Um, so when she was growing up, and then especially after her dad was out of the house, and he was still in her life, but he was out of the house, we would, I would have these feelings a lot, like I just don't want this for her. But I would decide that, well, it's what we have. And I have to make the best of this. And I would do that with her too. It's just the idea that when something is not the way we want it, um, you know, I would sometimes say, well, we're on an adventure or, you know, we're going to make some lemonade. It's just the optimism, the hope, and it's the way of functioning in a family uh, when you have a lemon. And the way that I talk to my clients about this is to say, when we lose a child or any loved one, we have this big, fat lemon. And we do not want this big, fat lemon but we have it and we can either bite into it and it's sour and bitter and we throw it against the wall or we can say, I'm not going to deal with this lemon. I'm going to put it on the kitchen counter and you leave it there and it sits there and it rots. Or you can say, I have this big fat sour lemon. What can I do with it? And I can slice it up and I can add some water, and I can add some sugar, and I can stir it, and I can make some lemonade. And somebody said to me, or I could make something else with it. And yes, you could, you could make lemon bars, or you could make lemon cake, but you bake, you make something with your lemon. And it's really an attitude. And it's really a choice. And so I had one client who, um, and this is another thing that I want people to recognize with the work that I do. And that is that these little siblings have relationships with their, with their siblings for the rest of their lives. I've coined the term sibling by heart. They're siblings by heart. They're not, not in presence. And I've had some parent, I've worked with some parents who had, for example, a stillborn child. And I worked with one mom who had a son who was born 10 months, no, 10 days after his big brother died. Wow. So she had this little boy um, and she started working with me when her little boy was about the age that his brother had been when he died. He was you know, two and a half or three. And she was starting and they were two different kids. And she was starting to deal, you know, recognize that she needed to deal with this living child who was more rambunctious than her other child. And she was and he was starting to be aware that, um, you know, there were just she thought, OK, I need to deal with the fact that he had a big brother. And so she worked with me and um, found the work that we did to be just very helpful to help her um, make her living son aware of her um, his big brother. Right. And one of the things that she uh, was so excited about was that all on his own, this little boy, when he became three, decided that he wanted to do a lemonade stand. And she was At just three years old. That's yes. Really amazing. And he was really serious about it. And he wanted and she was so excited about it because of 
our, our conversations about making lemonade, it was just such an interesting, you know, coincidental, not coincidental tie for her. And so they built a lemonade stand and he, I mean, he just was adamant about wanting this and he did the, his little lemonade stand and it was just an amazing success. Years old, yes. Like, everybody was like, Oh, you have to see this. Yes. Sure. Yes. And it was very healing for all of them because of the meaning that it had for her that he didn't even really recognize. And so it was just a really tangible reminder of her to for her of, um, you know, of what they needed to do to continue that bond with their son who died and then just, you know, nurture his little brother who was growing up without him. Wow. Michelle, I know that a lot of people would love to hear your advice about how we can raise our children with more confidence and less fear. Well, I, you're referring to the book, I think that I'm a part of, and it is so exciting. And I would really just love for people to go out and oh, get it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, this was, uh, it's the book is called uh, No Problem Parenting, right. Raising Your Kiddos with more confidence and less fear. And I am one of 21 authors in that book that was compiled by Jackie uh, Finneman, whose business is called No Problem Parenting. And she has a podcast of her own and had me as a guest on her podcast and really wanted me to be a part of this book, which I was very honored to be a part of uh, because she did a summit when this book was published, which was just earlier this month as we're recording this in, or early last month, we're recording this in October of 2022. Um, and I did a chapter on giving your child the gift of good grief. Um, and all the other authors in there are just amazing. There is so much good information in this book. I would encourage people to go to Amazon and get it. Um, and my chapter was uh, give your child the gift of good grief, which is something that we don't have to wait to have a big loss in their life to do with them because children experience grief over all kinds of things. Um, you know, that are not the loss of a loved one necessarily. And the way we respond as adults makes a difference in how they learn how to cope with loss and grief for later in their lives when they will have a loss, um, you know, like I had in my, um, in my early 40s. Sure. And um, so, when I talk about good grief, I talk about these things. Um, honoring grief when it happens. What Jackie talks about in her no problem parenting approach is three things. The first thing is seeking understanding. And so with our children, um, you know, to be sure that we understand how they're grieving, you and I mentioned before the interview started, and we are talking about me working with parenting, um, that there might be behavior issues that I might be able to help families with. And certainly when kids are grieving, that can be a part of how they show their grief. And we may not realize that's what's going on. So um, that's one thing I help parents with in that is recognizing, you know, how children show their grief. And then the second step in Jackie's no problem parenting is to, um, be prepared for the worst. And so the way that I talk about that in my chapter is, of course, being prepared for um, helping your family with loss and grief, which is one of the worst things a family can encounter. And that's just having the door open to have conversations with even really young children, which adults don't usually think we should do, you know, we should protect children from loss and not expose them to it. And it's really quite the opposite. And so, you know, good grief is being, um, being willing to, to you to say to a child, your brother died, use the D word, because that's the only word that accurately tells them what happened. Past doesn't, uh, went away, doesn't. So, 
that's a big thing for adults is to be willing to use that word when telling a young child what happened to someone are, they love. Are you, are you saying that telling a child being authentic with a child and telling them what is really going on helps to raise them with more confidence? In life? Yes. Yes. Why is that? Because when we don't um, understand what death is, we uh, get kind of hit by it. And um, telling a child when they're young that someone died is a lesson we don't want them to learn yet. But my daughter had to learn it at three and a half. And that means her, bro her brother's body stopped working. He couldn't talk to her anymore. He couldn't uh, play with her anymore. We weren't going to see him anymore. That prepared her for the future going forward and learning from that point on how we as a family cope with it and carry on anyway. And when we help kids uh, face the tough things in their early years, we are helping them to build resilience when we do those things that are all part of the good grief parenting approach. We um, help them experience loss and grief in healthy, helpful ways. You're normalizing it. You're not. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's such an important word, normalizing it. And so then, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, knocked sideways when they experience something later in life, they grow up with these skills of, oh, I've, you know, I've encountered this before. I, I coped with it then. I'll cope with it now. They can learn ways to cope. Children can learn that it's okay to be off by themselves if that's what they need to do and come back when they're ready. And certain things that help them know I need to deal with grief this way. One of the other important things that I help families with is you don't have to grieve, grieve the way someone else thinks you should. And you can say to them, what you're saying to me right now is not helpful. I, this is how I need to grieve right now. This is what our family needs to do. And imagine the confidence and the empowerment that a child feels when they learn those kinds of responses as a child too. So growing up with grief and loss and learning healthy life skills to cope is a, such a gift to kids. Are those part of your coaching programs? Because yes. I say, you say, see your way forward after child loss and parenting for the journey. Would you like to add anything about that? about your, those programs that you have? Yes, I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, parenting for the journey was what I came into good grief parenting, feeling like I wanted to do, which is this is, you know, what your child's going to need from the time they experience their loss in early childhood until adulthood, you know, they're going to go through these different um, parts of their lives, experiences of their lives. But I learned that I had to grapple with, you know, when is the right time to work with parents because they have their own grief and it's devastating. And we can't, I talk to some parents that say, frankly, I can't even think about what my child needs yet. I need to deal wow. with my own grief. So that's what see your way forward after child loss mm -hmm. does. It's really my comprehensive program that helps parents who say, okay, I've had this loss. I don't know what to do with it, but I realize that I can't just sit in this devastation and pain. And I'm ready, you know, you need to be ready, because you need to have the devastation and pain. There's, you don't have to rush out of that, you need to just experience that. But when you are ready to see your way forward, um, then this course helps you kind of look at all the pieces and gives you tools for all of the pieces. And then um, the C um, parenting for the journey really picks up where that one left leaves off and looks more at all of the different aspects of just good, solid parenting going forward. Now, do you do these uh, coaching programs online in person? Yes, it's it's but all been people get a hold of you to do this. Yeah, it's all virtual. Um, you know, I certainly could do it in person as well, but I do it virtually. Um, and people can reach me for anything uh, at my website, 
www.goodgriefparenting.com or find, and I'm on Instagram as Good Grief Parenting. And I'm at Linktree, which now, you know, we're all having these link trees with all of these links. And that's at Good Grief Parenting as well. And so if you Google Good Grief Parenting, you're going to find the way to get in touch with me. And you can inquire about my um, my coaching and my programs. You can have a free uh, consult with me. Is this your is this your offer for our grief and rebirth podcast audience? Well, the offer is the Good Grief Guide, which is uh, and that outlines a lot of what I've talked about today. It's just sort of um, introducing any adult who's working with a child who may be grieving. It's just introducing them to the things they need to be aware of to support children. And so the Good Grief Guide is available at Linktree. Um, there's a link there for that, Linktree slash Good Grief Parenting, or right on the front of my website, there's a button to, to get it there as well. So you can easily find the Good Grief Guide. That's and I would say- asset, That's a wonderful offer because if you're going through something like that, you want something to reach out for yes. right away. Yes. And that's good. I would say go get, I mean, that's not just for, um, you know, if you've had the, the, a death of a loved one. And you may not, it'd be nice to have that when you need it instead of saying, okay, now where do I go get that when your child comes home uh, tomorrow and, you know, their hamster died or, or whatever they right, might experience. Right, 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 right. That's interesting. Why would you say that healing is necessary for the remaking of life after loss? Why do we need to heal? Um, because healing is how you um, see that your life going forward is different from the life you had. And I came upon a quote when I was early in this work that was so perfect to kind of explain the difference between me and a counselor, me and a support group. And that's the quote by the author, Anne Royfe, who wrote a book after her husband died. And in it, she said, there are two parts to grief. The first part is loss. And the second part is the remaking of life. Mm -hmm. And loss is that part of, you know, the devastation, the tearing the away, the big gaping hole. That's what support groups, counselors help you get your feet back on the ground and cope with the loss. The remaking of life is everything that comes after that. And the only way that you can really take advantage of your life going forward is by healing from the pain that, you know, that, that made that rift between the life you had and the life you're going to have. And so uh, healing is just really that important part of being able to see that there's a lot available, a lot of possibilities of, ahead of you, bright possibilities, and even joy is what I want families who work with me to, you know, see their way forward toward. And that just, you know, that requires healing. And I will say, um, because I know you've you've encountered this too, um, Irene. You talk to so many people who are hurting from loss, as we all do. You will. It doesn't mean you're going to stop having your grief or stop hurting right. from your loss. That's not what healing is. That's not what recovery is. Recovery and healing are just the ability to to live forward and and realize that there are some good things ahead of you and you don't need to leave your loved one behind in order to go toward the good things. It's a choice. Mm -hmm, exactly. It's a choice of, of, of staying in the swamp and suffering and holding on to the story or mm -hmm. doing it and, and moving forward like you've done. You're an, a front, you're a role model. Look at what you've mm. done with your loss. Michelle, thank you for your valuable work. Well, that thank helps you. A, Thank you. That helps a grieving parent and his or her grieving child get beyond the immense pain of loss to enjoy good lives and even feel joy. And I thank you from my heart for this insight-filled, 
very touching interview today. Mm -hmm. And here's a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And if you're watching here on YouTube, be sure to subscribe below so you never miss an episode. As I like to say, to be continued, many blessings. And bye for now. Mm-hmm.